We, before we come to Prime Minister's questions, I'd like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation Proceedings is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. I now come to Prime Minister's questions. Mr. Prime Minister, question one. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I will shortly be updating the House on this country's fantastic progress in tackling COVID-19, including our booster programme, enabling us to ease Plan B measures and restore the ancient liberties of this country. Mr. Speaker, I know that the whole House will be delighted that Her Majesty the Queen has given permission for a special medal to be awarded to all those who deployed to Kabul. Operation Pitting saw our servicemen and women deliver the largest British evacuation since the Second World War. The whole country can be immensely proud of their service. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Wendy Chen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last year we were told by the Prime Minister there were no Downing Street parties. Then it turned out there were parties, but we were assured that no rules were broken. Last week, we heard that rules may have been broken, but that he thought it was a work event. And now yesterday, from the man who wrote the rules, it was, well, nobody told me what those rules were. <laughs> Mr Speaker, five weeks ago, the people of North Shropshire were clear, and the people of North East Fife are being clear to me now. No matter the excuse, there is no excuse for taking the British people for fools. Will the Prime Minister agree it is now time for him to resign? Yeah. Uh, no, Mr Speaker, but what I can tell her is that, I, as I said to the House last week, uh, I, I, I apologise sincerely for... Uh, any misjudgments that were made, uh, but she must contain her impatience, Mr Speaker, and wait for the inquiry next week before she draws any of the conclusions that she's just asserted. John Burrow. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Latest evidence and research shows that the UK is the most attractive country in the world amongst um, young people uh, in, across the G20. Amid intense soft power competition from other countries, including China, can the Prime Minister assure me and other members of the all British Party All Party Group, uh, sorry, British Council All Party Group, that the government will meet the British Council's funding requirements to ensure it doesn't have to close any more offices overseas, and to ensure that it commits all its energy to retaining our top spot? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I entirely share my. Right Honourable Friends, enthusiasm for the British Council, which is a wonderful institution uh, that uh, we all love, and that's why we're providing, through the FCDO, uh, £189 million of funding uh, this year, a 27% increase, Mr Speaker, in spite of all the difficulties this country is facing, 27% increase uh, on the previous financial year. We also provided a loan facility of up to £145 million to support all the wonderful work that the British Council does. Welcome to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start by warmly welcoming... Can I start... Listen to the Prime Minister. Can I just say, I expect people to listen to the Prime Minister. I certainly don't want the Leader of the Opposition shouted down. You might not like the day, but this is the day that we've got. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, I'm not bothered. I assumed it was directed over here. Um, um, uh, can I start by warmly welcoming the Honourable Member for Bury South to his new growth and to the Parliamentary Labour Party? Mr Speaker, like so many people up and down the country, he has concluded that the Prime Minister and the Conservative Party have shown themselves incapable of offering the leadership and government this country deserves, whereas the Labour Party stands ready to provide an alternative government that the country can be proud of. Mr Speaker, the Labour Party has changed, and so has the Conservative Party. He and anyone else who wants to build a new Britain built on decency, security, prosperity and respect is welcome in my Labour Party. Yeah. If 
every week the Prime Minister offers absurd and frankly unbelievable defences to the Downing Street parties, and each week it unravels. I've been elected the chair. I don't need to be told how to conduct the business. So if somebody wants to do some direction, I'll start directing them out of the chamber. Yeah. Yes, Armour. Mr Speaker, I'm see, I see the very noise. I'm, I'm sure the Chief Whip has told them to bring their own booze. <laughs> Let's try and get on with questions. It's going to be a long day, if not. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, first he said there were no parties. Then the video landed, blowing that defence out of the water. Next he said he was sicker than furious when he found out about the parties, until it turned out that he himself was at the Downing Street Garden Party. Then last week, last week he said he didn't realise he was at a party, and, surprise, surprise, no one believed him. So this week he's got a new defence. Nobody warned me that it was against the rules. That's it. <laughs> Nobody told him. Uh, since the Prime Minister wrote the rules, why on earth does he think that his new defence is going to work for him? Well, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, he talks about. Uh, the rules, and um, um, let, me, let me repeat what I said to uh, the Honourable Lady uh, uh, across the aisle uh, uh, earlier on. Of course, of course, Mr. Speaker, we must wait for the uh, we must wait for the outcome of the, of the inquiry. But I, re I, re I, re I renew what I've said, uh, Mr. Speaker. But when it comes to when it comes to his view, nobody believes what you said. Can we have a little less? I want to hear this Prime Minister like I wanted to lead the opposition. I want the same courtesy from both sides. Prime Minister. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, if we'd listened to the right honourable gentleman about, about COVID restrictions, which is the substance uh, of his question, uh, then, then Mr Speaker, we would still be uh, we would have been in lockdown after July. If, we, if, we, if we listen to if this is the truth, if we listen to the Labour front bench in the run up to Christmas and New Year, Mr Speaker, we would have stayed in uh, restrictions with huge damage uh, to the economy. And it's because, of the, it's because of the judgments that I've taken and that we have taken uh, in Downing Street that we now have the fastest growing economy in the G7. And, and GD, GDP, Mr. Speaker, now back up above pre pandemic levels. And as for Berry South, Mr. Speaker, as for, as for Berry South, uh, let, let, me say to, let, me say to the, let me say to the right gentleman, Mr. Speaker, by all means, may I say to the right honourable gentleman that the Conservative Party are one. Berry South for the first time in generations under this Prime Minister uh, with an agenda of uniting, uniting and levelling up and delivering for the people of Berry South. And Mr Speaker, we will win again in Berry South at the next election under this Prime Minister. It's important I hear, I want to hear both sides, and I don't want this continuous chant. Because if we do, there will be less people on these benches. And the same on the other side, I expect both sides to be heard with courtesy. Keir Starmer. Uh, Barry South is now a Labour seat, Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Oh, 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 no. oh, oh, no. Did somebody want some, me to apologise? No, somebody shouted apologise. I hope it wasn't aimed at me. No. And so we'll also have less from that corner, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Not only did he write the rules, but some of his staff say they did warn him about attending the party on the 20th of May 2020. Now, I've heard the Prime Minister's very carefully crafted response to that accusation. It almost sounds like a lawyer wrote it. <laughs> I will be equally careful with my question. When did the Prime Minister first become aware that any of his staff had concerns about the 20th of May party? Uh, uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, I am I'm, I'm grateful to Ronald Jump for uh, repeating the question that he's, uh, that he's, he's already asked. We, we have uh, answered, uh, Mr Speaker, 
that it is for the inquiry to, to come forward uh, with uh, an explanation of what happened, and we, I'm afraid he simply, he simply must wait. But he asks about my staff. Mr. Speaker, he asks he asks about uh, my staff and what my staff are doing and what they and what they uh, have told me. And I can tell him, Mr. Speaker, that they have taken decisions throughout this pandemic uh, that that he has that he has opposed to open up in in July, Mr. Speaker, as I have said, to mount the fastest vaccine rollout in in Europe, uh, and and Mr. Speaker, to double the speed of the booster rollout. Uh, with the result that we have the most open economy in Europe, Mr. Speaker, and we, ha- and we have more people uh, in employment and more pe- employees on the payroll now than there were before the pandemic began. That is what my staff have been working on in Downing Street, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm proud of them. Keir Starmer. So, Mr. Speaker, apparently Sue Gray is going to tell the Prime Minister when he first became aware that his staff had <laughs> concerns about the May 20th. <laughs> Uh, the Prime Minister's account gets more extraordinary with each version of his defence. If the Prime Minister's new defence were true, it requires him to suggest that his staff are not being truthful when they say they warned him about the party. It requires the Prime Minister to, to expect us to believe that whilst every other person who was invited on the 20th of May to the party was told it was a social occasion, he alone was told it was a work meeting. It also requires us, requires the Prime Minister, to ask us to accept that as as he waded through the empty bottles and platters of sandwiches, he didn't realise it was a party. Does the Prime Minister realise how ridiculous that sounds? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I've, I've said what I've said about uh, the events in Number Ten. Uh, he will have to. He will have to wait uh, for the. He'll have to wait for the report. And, and Mr Speaker, I think. It, I think you know. He, he asks for uh, for further clarification. I think there are lots of people who are interested. I say this entirely in passing, Mr Speaker. Lots of people are interested in the exact legal justification uh, from the learned, uh, the learned uh, leader of the opposition uh, for, for, for the picture of him drinking a pint of beer or a bottle of beer. Perhaps, perhaps, he, perhaps he could tell the House about that in a, mi- in a minute, Mr. Speaker. But what I can, what I can, what I can tell the House is that uh, throughout the pandemic, people in across government have been working flat out to protect the British public uh, with, with a huge quantities of PPE, so we can now make 80% in this country with the biggest and most generous furlough scheme uh, virtually anywhere in the world. And the fastest. And by the way, Mr. Speaker, if we listened to them, if we listened to them, we would have stayed in the European Medicines Agency, and we would never have been able to deliver the vaccine rollout at the speed that we did. Mr. Speaker, if the Prime Minister thinks the only accusation he faces is that he once had a beer with a the takeaway, then Operation Save Big Dog is in deeper <laughs> trouble than I thought. If a Prime Minister misleads Parliament, should they resign? So, Mr Speaker, let's be absolutely clear. Uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman is continuing to ask a series of questions which he knows will be fully addressed uh, by the inquiry. Uh, he, is wasting, he is wasting this House's time. He is wasting the people's time, Mr Speaker. He continues to be completely irrelevant, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, to the, to the, to, we have, because we have an inquiry. We have an inquiry, Mr Speaker, and I am and I, and I, and not going to anticipate that inquiry any further. What I, what I can tell him is that it is because of the judgments that were taken in Downing Street and because of the uh, willingness of the British people uh, to put trust, by the way, Mr Speaker, in those judgments uh, to, co- to, come, to come forward in huge numbers to get vaccinated, which people did, and I thank them for it, for the bottom of my heart, people did that. Uh, because they listened to our messages, Mr Speaker, and it was a result of that that we now have the fastest growing economy in the G7 and un- youth unemployment, which he ought to care about, youth unemployment at a record low, Mr Speaker. Well, I, I know it's not going well, Prime Minister, but look on the bright side. At least the staff at number 10 know how to pack a suitcase. <laughs> Mr Speaker, last year... Last year, Her Majesty the Queen sat alone 
when she marked the passing of the man she had been married to for 73 years. She followed the rules of the country that she leads. On the eve of that funeral, a suitcase was filled with booze and wheeled into Downing Street. A DJ played and staff parted late into the night. The Prime Minister has been forced to hand an apology to Her Majesty the Queen. Isn't he ashamed that he didn't hand in his resignation at the same time? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I understand why the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman continues to politicise issues. Sorry, sorry Prime Minister. We normally would not, and quite rightly, mention the Royal Family. Yeah. We don't get into discussions on the Royal Family. Well, it, well in that case, Mr Speaker, I must ask the Right Honourable Gentleman to withdraw it. Yeah. I've dealt, I've dealt with it. Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer, if you... Are you going to... When we draw it... Order! 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 Prime Minister, we don't want to go through that again. I'll make the decisions. The answer is that the next question I'm going back to Keir Starmer to ask his final question. Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Whilst the Prime Minister wastes energy defending the indefensible, people's energy bills are rocketing. Yeah. Yeah. Labour has a plan to deal with it. Act VAT for everyone, provide extra support for the hardest hit and pay for it with a one-off tax on oil and gas companies. A serious plan for a serious problem. What's the government offering? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. Too distracted by their own chaos to do their job. Yeah. While Labour was setting out plans to heat homes, he was buying a fridge to keep the party wine chilled. While we were setting out plans to keep bills down, he was planning parties. And while we were setting out plans to save jobs in the steel industry, he was, he was trying to save just one job, his own. Doesn't the country deserve so much better than this out of touch, out of control, out of ideas, and soon to be out of office, Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you what this government has been doing to look after the people of this country throughout this pandemic and, and beyond. Uh, we have been cutting uh, the cost of living, helping them with the, the living wage. We've been, we've been raising. We've been, rate, we've been cutting taxes for people on low pay, Mr Speaker. We've been increasing payments uh, for people uh, suffering the costs of fuel. Prime Minister, look after people. can I just say to everyone in here, our constituents want to hear the questions and the answers. The great British public, the members of this United Kingdom which you are representing, they need to hear. Please. Let's hear the questions and answers. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we will continue to look after people throughout this uh, pandemic and, and beyond. But we've also, Mr Speaker, been cutting crime by 10 per cent, putting 11,000 more police officers already out on the Record home building last year, Mr more homes than at any time in the last 30 years. We are building 40 new hospitals, Mr Speaker. Gigabit broadband, gigabit broadband has gone up from 9 per cent coverage in our country to 65 per cent already. And as I said already, I think three times or four times today, we have more people, more employees on the payroll now than before the pandemic began. And, uh, and unemployment, youth unemployment, at a record low, Mr Speaker. And when the history of this pandemic comes to be written, and the history of the Labour Party comes to be written, and believe me, they are history and will remain history, Mr Speaker. It will show, it will show, it will show that we delivered while they dithered, and we we vaccinated while they vacillated, Mr Speaker. And, and the reason we've been able to lift restrictions faster than any other country in Europe, and we have the most open economy and the most open society in Europe, Mr Speaker, is thanks to the booster rollout and thanks to the work of staff up and down Whitehall, across government, throughout the NHS, Mr Speaker, and I am intensely proud of what this government has done. You'll get more if you let the questions come. Mark Palsy. Th 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 thank you, Mr Speaker. Following on from the excellent news on the economy and jobs, the Prime Minister will remember my question to him last June about proposals for a gigafactory in Coventry. 
Last week, local councils granted outline planning permission to create 6,000 new skilled jobs to secure many thousands of others, inject £2.5 billion into our local economy and level up across our region. With fast rising demand for greener and cleaner electric cars, may I ask him for his support to ensure the swift delivery of this vitally important project? I thank my honourable friend for campaigning for uh, this wonderful project, and we are supporting the electric vehicle industry. We have made another £350 million available through the Automotive Transformation uh, Fund, on top of the half a billion pound uh, that we, commitment that we have already made in the, in the ten point plan. And uh, I know that uh, the campaign for Coventry Airport is an excellent one. I look forward to seeing how it develops. We now come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week was supposed to be Operation Save Big Dog, <laughs> but it's quickly become Operation Dog's Dinner. Over the past few days, we've had more damaging revelations about Downing Street rulemaking, more evidence that Parliament has been misled, and an even longer list of ludicrous absolutely ludicrous excuses from the Prime Minister. First he claimed there were no parties. Then he wasn't present. Then he admitted he was at them, but he didn't know it was a party. And then, Mr Speaker, the latest sorry excuse is really the most pathetic of them all. Nobody told me. (laughs) Nobody told me. Nobody told the Prime Minister he was breaking his own rules. Absolutely pathetic. The Prime Minister, you know, what a look. What a look. The Prime Minister laughing once again, laughing at the British public. The Prime Minister is taking the public for fools. Nobody, nobody believes him. Will the Prime Minister finally take responsibility, resign, go, Prime Minister? Uh, no, Mr Speaker, but I, I thank him for his question again. And uh, let, let, me just, let me just remind him that uh, there's a, an inquiry that is due to, uh, to conclude. Uh, I, I, I believe he is wrong in what he asserts, Mr Speaker, but we'll have to wait and see what the, uh, what the inquiry says. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, I think the most important thing from, from the point of view of, of the UK Government is that uh, we're coming out of uh, the restrictions that we've been in. I'm delighted to see that that's happening in Scotland as well. Uh, and uh, and I, that is very largely thanks to the wonderful cooperation uh, that we continue to see across the whole of the UK, though you wouldn't believe it to hear it from him. Ian Blackford. Mr Speaker, I'm afraid nobody is buying this act anymore. There ought to be some respect and dignity from the Prime Minister. Let's remind ourselves more than 150,000 of our citizens here, have died, here. and he's partying, he's laughing. Mr Speaker, it simply isn't acceptable. The fake contrition, the endless excuses, the empty promises that it will be different only if we give him one last chance. This is a Prime Minister who arrogantly believes that he's above the rules, a Prime Minister who brazenly twists the truth, a Prime Minister who simply isn't fit for office. The Prime Minister's former Chief Advisor has said that he lied to Parliament, breaking the Ministerial Code. Prime Minister, a resignation offence. Public trust is hemorrhaging. With every day that passes, this Tory Government loses even more credibility. When will the Tory MPs finally do the right thing? Show the Prime Minister the door. Mr Speaker, the, I, I, I thank the right honourable gentleman, but I must say that I disagree with him. And I think that uh, when you look at the, the levels of trust that the British people, uh, uh, people in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, across the whole country, have shown in government, uh, that, uh, that there is the single biggest index, Mr Speaker, of that trust has been their willingness to come forward voluntarily, voluntarily, Mr Speaker unlike many other countries in the world, uh, to get vaccinated on a scale uh, not seen anywhere else in Europe. And and that is because of our ability uh, to, and the NHS's ability, to persuade people that it's the right thing. It's a fantastic thing. And by by the way, Mr Speaker, it's also a tribute to the United Kingdom, because that vaccine rollout was a UK effort. 
Paul Benson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to exporting, as you're well aware, file punches well above its weight. And the Prime Minister saw this when he visited BE Systems' Factory of the Future in Lancashire last year. In addition, fantastic local businesses such as Helical Technologies, Tangerine Holdings and Nature's Aid are doing a great job for flying the flag for Lancashire globally. But I've also got many smaller businesses who are eager to get exporting into new markets. What steps is the Prime Minister taking to help file businesses make the most of Brexit and maximise export potential? Well, I thank him for, for, for championing. I thank him for what he's doing to champion trade with, uh, with Latin America. And, uh, and I'm, I've no doubt that businesses, small businesses such as uh, Squire Hair, uh, are, are, are eager to get into uh, those, those new markets, and uh, we will do everything uh, that we can uh, to help and support him in his efforts. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Uh, as the cost of living crisis deepens, this government's priorities get ever more remote from my Kirkcaldy and Cowdenbeath constituency. Uh, uh, only this week, I learned uh, a veteran in my constituency, James Scott, took his own life uh, as a result of uh, his struggle with mounting financial pressures. This is a government who were found to have acted unlawfully by the High Court over COVID contracts and now preparing to write off £4.3 billion allocated to those COVID schemes. Why can the UK government find billions of pounds for profiteers and fraudsters, but they can't find compassion to treat the people with dignity, lifting the benefits cap and reinstating the cut to universal credit? Well, first of all, Mr Speaker, I want to say how sorry I am uh, for what he's had to say about James Scott and... Uh, this government does as much as we can to support veterans, and that's why uh, we published the Veterans Action Plan uh, only, only uh, the other day, Mr. Speaker. But what we're also doing is ensuring that we support people throughout this crisis. He mentions, uh, and, I, and, I've, and I've, I've said in my answer to the, to the right honourable gentleman, uh, many of the steps that we're taking to protect people uh, on, on low incomes, and we will continue to do more, Mr. Speaker. He attacks the the uh, contracts for, for PPE. Actually, I think it was an astonishing thing, uh, at great speed, to be able to uh, give this country 17 billion items of PPE, thanks to the efforts of, uh, of, of people across Whitehall. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this country is now capable of producing 80 per cent of our, of our own PPE. Kate Griffiths. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Shortly before Christmas, my constituent, Oliver Freckleton, was found at home having been stabbed to death on the eve of his 20th birthday. Yesterday, his heartbroken parents held their son's funeral. Oliver leaves behind a partner and a baby daughter, and two teenagers have been arrested for his murder. Now, this tragic event leaves behind a devastated family, friends, and a very worried community. I'm grateful for the work that Staffordshire Police is undertaking to tackle violent crime in my constituency, and the extra 149 additional police officers recruited is very welcome. But does the Prime Minister agree with me that a multi-stakeholder approach is vital to tackling crimes amongst our young people? And what can the government do to support not just the police, but schools, colleges and local authorities in working to address this issue? My honourable friend, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm very sad to hear the news of, uh, of the, the loss of her constituent, uh, Oliver. And uh, like, like so many uh, victims of violent crime, uh, the answer, as is, as is the case with so many victims, the answer is not just policing, though that is vitally important, and that's why we're investing so massively in 20,000 uh, more police officers uh, and supporting them uh, with uh, toughening the law, Mr Speaker. Uh, but it's also, as, as she rightly says, important to get uh, all the institutions of the state to work together, schools, colleges, uh, social services uh, and the health service, mental health service as well. Jessica Morton. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Why is it so hard for this Prime Minister to admit that he made the rules, so he should know the rules yeah. and he should follow the rules. Yep. Everyone out there knows it's as simple as that. Yeah. And if he had any shred of compassion for all those out there who've suffered through this, he'd go. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, 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 I entirely uh, understand people's uh, feelings and I, and I entirely support what she says about uh, obeying the rules when you make the rules. She's, com she's completely right. Uh, on, on the other hand, I, I do urge her, I do urge her to, to wait, as I've said to the uh, benches, to wait until next week. 
Paul Hull. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, the opposition have been told there's going to be an inquiry. They've visited every single question on one issue. Well, my constituents want to get on with other things. In, in, in January 2021, the government estimated that at least £800 million would be released from the Dormant Assets Scheme extension. Does he agree with me that funding through a new community wealth fund will be a catalyst to level up the most left-behind communities, and the bill should include specific provision for a consultation on the scope, shape and nature of such a fund? Uh, Mr Speaker, we uh, certainly are legislating to uh, – thank you very much uh, – we will be legislating to expand the Dormant Assets Scheme uh, to include new financial assets, which would unlock an estimated £880 million. Uh, we will be considering how to spend the English uh, portion of that, and the Community Wealth Fund that he proposes is certainly an option, and I thank him very much. Peter Grant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent, Anne, has told me a friend saw the ambulance outside the house on the night Anne's husband died. She was not allowed to go into the house to comfort her friend. Anne's husband went to his rest in an almost empty building, while scores of his friends stood freezing outside. Anne went home to an empty house to grieve the rest of the day alone. My constituent Susan was not allowed to go in the ambulance or even follow the ambulance, blue light and all, after her husband had a heart attack. Other constituents had the heartbreaking realisation they were not allowed to go into care homes to break the news in person to their relatives that someone else in the family had died. Mr Speaker, in their words, not mine, in their words, the Prime Minister is a charlatan, a hypocrite and a liar. What will he now say to my constituents? Look, I know you are repeating what your constituents said. I want more moderate and temperate language. Prime Minister, you might just want to deal with the general question, certainly not the answer. I, th I thank you, Mr Speaker. And I, I, want, I want to repeat that uh, I understand the, the feelings that he has relayed uh, to me, as I said, I said last week, and I sympathise uh, very deeply with uh, the, the feelings, and I understand uh, why people feel as they do. And I, I thank people very much for everything they have done. I recognise the enormous sacrifice that people have made. Uh, I apologise for misjudgments that uh, may be made in number 10 by me uh, and anybody else, uh, but please can I ask him to wait uh, for the inquiry to conclude. Andrew Lower. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I recently attended a debate held by my honourable friend for West Aberdeenshire and Kincardin seeking a central London memorial for the Photographic Reconnaissance Unit, and in it I referenced my Northampton South constituent, Mosquito Pilot, Mr George Pritchard, who is 98 next week uh, and is one of the last surviving members of the unit. Will the Prime Minister join my honourable friend, me and Mr Pritchard in backing this fitting and needed memorial? Uh, I, I thank him very much and uh, I will certainly uh, do what I can to support it, though, of course, uh, as he knows, the memorial to George Pritchard, though, as he knows, this is a matter for local authorities. Uh, what this uh, House and what this Government can certainly do is ensure that uh, memorials are not desecrated, uh, as they have been uh, across this country, and make sure that we support uh, legislation uh, that penalises those who indulge in such desecration, Mrs. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, when a Prime Minister is spending his time trying to convince the great British public that he's actually stupid rather than dishonest, isn't it time that he goes now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Qu Mr Speaker, I, I, I think that was a question for you uh, r rather than me, but I'm not. I, I, look, I, I've, I've made my point. Yeah. I, I think that the British public uh, have responded to uh, what this government has had to say in the most eloquent way possible. They have beaten COVID uh, so far, Mr Speaker. They have helped to defeat COVID so far, Mr Speaker, with the steps they have taken uh, by getting vaccinated and implementing Plan B. And I thank them. Just for the Prime Minister, for the record, it's not the Speaker's questions. Mr Robert Gumbel. Our armed forces have earned the respect and admiration of our nation, not least during the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. On Remembrance Sunday, we commemorate their sacrifices, but on Armed Forces Day, on the 25th of June, we will celebrate all that is amazing about our Army, Navy and Air Force. Yeah. Yeah. In a normal year, we get about 20,000 people at the event in Scarborough, but this year we will finally host, after two twice being postponed, National Armed Forces Day. Yeah. Will the Prime Minister pull out all the stops on land, sea and air to make this truly an event to remember? Yeah. Uh, I, 
Right. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have no doubt that Armed Forces Day will be absolutely uh, spectacular across the country and that Scarborough uh, will make a terrific uh, contribution and a notable uh, contribution as well. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last April, I asked the Prime Minister if he agreed with the principle that politicians shouldn't lie. He replied that he concurred with the basic principle that the Honourable Gentleman has just enunciated. Would he like to amend the record? <laughs> no, Mr. Speaker. Simon Hall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the vast majority of people, and indeed politicians across Northern Ireland, believe that whatever the question, double jobbing is not the answer. Could I urge my right honourable friend to listen to the majority and ask him not to move the government amendment in the other place later today? Uh, I, I, I'm grateful to my, uh, my honourable friend, and uh, I'm, I'm advised that I think the amendment in, in question is indeed going to be uh, withdrawn. Twist. Mr Speaker, my constituents are rightly angry at the Prime Minister's behaviour. But while Downing Street fights to save his political life, people across the North East are worrying about rising food and energy bills, rising unemployment and rising levels of child poverty. He talks about levelling up, but my constituents are seeing opportunities cut. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that his government has failed and it's time for him to go? Yeah. Uh, no, no, Mr. Speaker, I, I really don't agree with her, and I, I don't think she could have been following anything that's been said this afternoon. Uh, we have we have unemployment falling to near record lows, Mr. Speaker, and we are we have job vacancies. We have job vacancies uh, at record highs, Mr. Speaker. That's what Conservative governments do. They create jobs and they get and they get the economy moving. David Davis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like many on these benches, I spent weeks and months defending the Prime Minister uh, against often angry constituents. I reminded them of his success in delivering Brexit and on the vaccine and many other things. But I expect my leaders to shoulder the responsibility for the actions they take. Yesterday, he did the opposite of that. So I'll remind him of a quotation altogether too familiar to him, of Leo Amory to Neville Chamberlain. You have sat there too long for all the good you have done. In the name of God, go. Order, Prime Minister. I, I, I must say to the right honourable gentleman, I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, but uh, what, I can, what I can tell him, uh, I don't know what quotation he's alluding to that he re he's referring. But what I can tell him is that I, and I think I've told this house repeatedly uh, throughout this throughout this pandemic, I take full responsibility for everything done in this government uh, and, and uh, throughout the pandemic. Stephen Kinnock. Does the Prime Minister agree with the Leader of the House that the Leader of the Scottish Conservatives is a lightweight? <laughs> uh, Mr Speaker, the, the Conservative, the, the conservative uh, approach to the Union is one that I think is right for our country. Uh, we want to keep it uh, together and, uh, I, and, and I think Conservatives in Scotland do an excellent job and, and that's why uh, their, their stout defiance their stout defence of the union was repaid at the last election, uh, and Labour, Mr. Speaker, is increasingly endangering our unions. Clayton Drummond. Much, Mr. Speaker, and many people last week welcomed the five-year moratorium on smart motorways. However, the M27 is due to be open as a smart motorway in a couple of months. What reassurance can my right honourable friend give my constituents, the Moon Valley, and others in the rest of South Hampshire that the M27 will be safe? and give them confidence to use it. I, 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 I thank you very much, uh, and I can assure her that uh, we are well aware of the uh, risks associated with the smart motorway scheme. I know that my right honourable friend, the Secretary for Transport, is, uh, is looking at it right now. We now come to the Prime Minister's COVID-19 